Yeah, uh, Andy, what's today? Today, Tiff Day. Tiff Day. Inspection Day. This is kind of the day we've been uh, waiting for to see if this old minivan will get through Germany's rigorous inspection. I did a ton of work on this van to get it ready for German inspection because I had heard it was going to be difficult. I replaced ball joints. It's the ball joint on that side. The ball joint on that side. Uh, tie rod ends. And the tie rod end here. And the tie rod end there. CV joints. I ground the rust off of underbody components to make them look better. And some of them I even painted black. I wanted to give myself the best chance at passing inspection. Before we headed to the inspector, Andreas and I did a few last minute things on the van. Installing the Voyager badge. We're about to get this thing inspected, and it's gotta look good for the inspector. You can't have him look at this car and wonder, what is it? It's a price of Voyager. That's what it is. Alright, the inspection is coming up very soon. I'm doing an engine mount. I have 10 minutes to do this engine mount change, uh, or we might be pushing it. So this is about to be the engine mount change of a lifetime. Look! You, you might have caught me on video wrenching very quickly. So fast I broke the ratchet. That's how fast I was wrenching. Oh god. I only have like 7 minutes left. This is supposed to take 10 minutes. I have the TIFF appointment soon. I've made a grave error. This is a grave error. Seems fine to me. I don't see the problem. We'll get it. Eh. I think I'm definitely over my 10 minute limit, but the new engine mount is in. Right here. Looking all engine mounty and whatnot. We are trying to get all the oil off the engine so that the tip inspector thinks this thing doesn't have a leak. Or a horrible leak, I should say. I don't think I'm going to convince anyone that it doesn't have a leak at all. With the car all fixed up and looking good, I hit the Autobahn for the very first time. Headed to the inspector now. The first, the van's first run on the Autobahn. Everything seems to be okay. It's driving pretty smoothly. I'm here with Jens, another journalist. How, what do you think, Jens? How, how's, it, how's it driving? It uh, drives very well. I mean, the engine sounds healthy. In short order, I was at a car wash, making sure that this thing had the best chance of impressing inspectors. From the car wash, I pretty much rolled coal all the way to the inspection garage on the east side of Nuremberg. After spending about $130 on the inspection, a technician hopped into my van and right away, within 10 seconds, I failed. We're here pretty late at night after failing the TIFF inspection. Within 10 seconds, I mean, literally, the guy gets in, he puts the key in the ignition, he turns it on, and then he's like, okay, off. Oh, the steering wheel locks with the key in, therefore it's a failure. With the idea being, if you have to turn your car off, um, for an emergency, for some reason, you should still be able to steer your car. My theory is that he is used. To, the inspector is the inspector is used to having fewer positions in his in steering uh, um, ignition switches. Before I go on, check out this ignition switch on a Toyota MR2. You've got start, on, accessory, lock. For comparison, here's how the switch works on my Voyager. There's start, on, off, lock, and then accessory. So this one has a lock position, that's where you can take the key out, it has this intermediate off position, then it's got the on position. So my theory is that the rule is, in the off you should be able to turn your car off, like I just did, and steer, which I can. But I can't steer in the lock position, so I think I should still pass because in the off position, you can still steer. steer. So the point is, you can turn the car off and still steer. You just can't turn the key all the way to lock. So I think this should pass. Anyway, let's get back to the inspection because I actually failed because of more than just that ignition switch. It's doing a brake test. So here's the deal with the gauges there off to the side. What those are reading is stopping force in kilonewtons. 
the inspector is looking for not just overall stopping power, but also evenness between the two brakes on the same axle. There's only allowed to be a 25% delta or smaller between the left and right wheel on each axle in terms of braking force. The park brake in the rear is allowed to have 50% between the left and right. So he's doing the park brake test. I quickly learned that my rear brakes and my rear park brake had failed. All right, he's checking the lights. Reverse lights, fog lights, hazards, everything, brakes. Inspectors also check the headlight for aim, brightness, and beam pattern. My passenger side light failed miserably, and then my driver's side light decided to go dim for some strange reason. What is, what is going on with this light? <laughs> so this light has fallen, has come loose, and appears to be filled with water, because we just went to a car wash, which is a major error in retrospect. Mm. Frankly, things are not going well here at TIFF. They're going very poorly. I've got a park brake issue, which I can adjust. I'm not worried about that. The headlight, I made a major error by uh, washing it. But it shouldn't fill with water anyway, so that I need a new headlight. And then we have an issue with the other light, which doesn't work for some reason. And then there's a problem with the steering column. This is not going well. <laughs> Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, disaster struck. Things are going very poorly. Oh, Look at this. It revved it up and it popped the heater core hose right off. The inspector had shoved a sniffer into the exhaust pipe and then revved the engine way up for the emissions test. This had not gone well. I'm going to be honest, this TIFF inspection could not have gone worse. It really could not. This is a disaster. This is a disaster. Cool down here. Uh, yeah. It needs a better hose clamp. It uh, needs a hose clamp that's yeah. how it's supposed to be. Huh. Think that'll stay on? Just took a little shower. Uh, how much coolant did we lose? Looks like a lot. I don't think so. Yeah, there is quite a bit down here. That's your coolant. Yeah, there's my coolant. Oh, okay. Hopefully, we'll get a little deeper, otherwise. Okay, now here comes the suspension. This is just, uh. This is just not good. This is just not good. <laughs> Look at all the coolant dripping. Oh, this explains where the coolant came from before, remember? Yeah. Yeah, look, it's dripping right where we saw coolant before. Someone Yeah. Well, it must have been on there, but not clamped. Wow. Didn't lose coolant? I think, uh, I think it was on there, but not clamped properly. Ooh. <laughs> It wasn't all bad news. When the inspector looked underneath the car, he was pretty impressed by the way everything looked. There were lots of new parts, there wasn't a lot of rust, and when we put the van up on these sliding platforms to flex the suspension, all the suspension and steering parts looked pretty good. Checking the suspension parts. high rod ends, ball joints, etc. I'm going to pause here for a second to point out that not only does this contraption put lateral loads on the front suspension, but it also steers the front axle. Watch. Okay, we just filled it up with water and we're going to try another pedal to the metal full throttle run and let's see what else blows up. At this point, this inspection, 
is a bit of a shit show. He revved it up and there's uh, no coolant leak anymore, so that's good. Yep. Here we go. Honestly, <laughs> the Jaguar doesn't want black smoke on it, so they're, close <laughs> they're closing the divider. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Seeing a lot of red on that screen over there. This display shows carbon monoxide output read by the sniffer in the tailpipe. They're measuring the CO output. Honestly, it's scary hearing this thing rev so high. 400,000 kilometer engine. I, I know nothing about its history at all. Sounds concerning. <laughs> you mean the discussion? No, uh, uh, the engine revving that high. That uh, a diesel. <laughs> A diesel should not rev that high. It just should not. It is, it is abnormal. It is, it is unnatural. It is alarming. Toby just uh, um, let us know that. What was that, Toby? How's he? This is excellent. This is excellent news. All right, Toby. Uh, what are we looking at? You need uh, to put this on your uh, on your battery. Okay. And. But the problems are. Wait, wait! Don't pause the, like that. The uh, the rear brake. Okay, rear brake is too weak. Got it. The parking brake uh, is also too weak, but only on one side. Wait, wait, so the rear brake. The rear brake. Regular brake is is, is too the weak. The regular rear brake. Okay, got it. Uh, the parking brake is too weak on one side. Okay. That's probably because of this very strange construction of two different cables and uh, two same drums. Um, okay. <laughs> but maybe you can just adjust it. Okay, we'll try. Then uh, your uh, headlight, the right one, you probably need a new housing. Because it's not bright enough or? It's not bright enough. Uh, there is water inside <laughs> and uh, well, it's loose. Toby's holding the inspection report which lists the five failures. Four of which are labeled Erheblicher Mengel, which means more significant failures, and one of which is labeled a dangerous failure, or Gefährlicher Mangel. The dangerous failure was the steering lock. The more significant failures were the headlight aim and pattern being wrong, and then the rear brakes. The table below shows the brake values in decanewtons, left and right. You can see the front brakes at 330 left, 360 right. It's fairly balanced, there was no issue there. But the rear brakes at 130 left, 170 right, that wasn't balanced enough, wasn't within the 25% allowed, so that failed. And the park brake at 220 left, 80 right, that wasn't within 50% allowed, so major failure there. The last one is your steering. It's not supposed to, uh, to lock in uh, position zero. There is no exception, uh, not as far as those three low, mm -hmm. but well, maybe if you find out something else and uh, can somehow approve it, right? It's okay. Okay, show us the problem. You mind showing us the problem on the car? You turn it and it locks. So the rule is it cannot lock if the key is in the ignition at all.
that's it. Damn. I don't know how to fix <laughs> that. I literally don't know how to fix that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, in your estimation, how poorly did this uh, TÜV go? Well, uh, I've had far worse cars in here. So Good. Hell yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right far better than, than expected the Chrysler Voyager is not the shittiest car that Toby has ever inspected so uh, could be worse but it did not go well but of course I didn't give up I drove directly from the inspection garage to my workshop and Toby and I got to wrenching what are you doing Toby I'm sending the brake shoes because to get some uh, more surface on it so because they... <laughs> Maybe get better grip. Yeah, because it failed the the brake strength test. We inspected the drum brake hardware, sanded the shoes and drums, dried out the headlight, but then I still had one thing I had to solve, that steering lock. To solve my steering lock issue, I had to figure out if my van even had a problem. So I called a local American car dealership and they said no it didn't it was acting perfectly normally to confirm I reached out to the Chrysler Voyager King of Germany his name is Tizian and these photos you're looking at are of his garage he has a bunch of Voyagers he even started a, a Chrysler Voyager forum in Germany he's obsessed Tizian was kind enough to hop into a bunch of his vans to see if the steering column would lock with the key still in the ignition Clearly that's how this van was designed. Even if the key is still in the ignition, if it's in the lock position, the column will lock. Toby called the inspectors and they agreed that was fine. That was a relief. Okay, we are back at the TÜV inspection center. There it is, you can see it above. Uh, failed yesterday and I fixed the brakes, fixed the headlight convinced them that the ignition key, the lock thing is fine, made sure that all the hoses are tight so they don't blow off anymore. Um, yeah, we're going to see. Hopefully it passes today. After Toby fixed a clip that held my headlight in place, and after I used a blow dryer to clear my lens, I passed the headlight test. Still, I had brake problems. The rear brake test, here we go. Looks like they're even-ish. The left one's not as strong. 1.2 to 2.5. <laughs> Look, it's measuring newton meters up there. Let's see. Yeah, that's the part, the handbrake. Yeah, it's, they're pretty close. We shall see. Obviously, you want those lines to be at exactly the same point, ideally. Here's the test report. The good news is the park brake passed. Toby and I had adjusted it the night prior. And so we're at 220 decanewtons left, 120 decanewton right. That's within the 50% spec. But the rear hydraulic brakes were still no good and considered an erhebliche mangel. So a significant defect. 130 decanewton left, 250 right. That's way off of the 25% tolerated. After the rear brakes failed twice, this meant war. 
I decided to take my rear brakes completely apart. Okay, so I removed the drum and started pressing the brake pedal, and it, what happened is kind of what I expected. This piston moves forward, and actually too far, I ended up blowing out the seal, so I'm going to have to put the seal back in place. But the rear piston did not move, which tells me that it's seized in place, and that's why I'm not getting the brake force I need. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is just take the wheel cylinder apart, sand it, and put it back together. Should be fine. Now we've got our wheel cylinder on the left side here on the bench. I'm just going to take it apart. These are extremely simple. I mean, the brake line goes in here, and fluid gets shoved into this cylinder here and pushes out these pistons. And the pistons are what push against the shoes that ultimately push against the spinning rotor to stop your car. It's You won't believe how easy these... How simple these things are. This is the dust boot, the rust, excuse me, the rubber thing. Oh, there is rust. The rubber thing is uh, the dust boot. Um, you can see there is some rust in there, which could cause some issues. Um, I'm going to pop out the pistons, and you'll, you'll be able to see just how simple this contraption is. It's literally just a metal piston, and there'll be a rubber. Ooh, that's weird. It's a spring. Really? That's spring. It's a weird looking spring, is that? What's the deal with this spring? It's like all cocked like that. Anyway, you can see there's this is the rubber seal right there, right here. So each of them has a little rubber seal on there to keep the to keep it from leaking. All right, I'm currently sanding the inside of the wheel cylinders with this fine sanding sandpaper here. This one's already done. See things. Uh, I guess this one's not already done. Zoiks, that doesn't look good. I gotta knock that rust off there. All right, so today is round three of the German TÜV inspection. Oh, wait a sec. Before I get up, go on with that, look at this. A Chrysler LeBaron, no shit. Right here in Nuremberg. Wow. Holy crap. A LeBaron. GTC. So that is actually built on the K-Car platform, which underpins my minivan. So that my minivan and that are built on the same platform. Can you believe that? Or a variant of the same platform. That's crazy. Anyway, rear brakes today, German inspection. Let's see what happens. Here we are back at TÜV. Round three. I failed twice. Just adjusted the brakes. Let's see what happens. Third time's a charm, I hope. All right. Looks like the front brakes look good. Oh, the handbrake should be better. You didn't touch the handbrake. Yeah, right? we did. We made it better. Okay, good. I hope we're gonna find out. Okay. They're going up together. So far, so good. All right. We're getting a bit of a delta. Yeah, that looks pretty good. They're close. More than. Like almost 50, at least 50%. We'll see. I don't know. And now I think these are the regular brakes here. They gotta go up together. They're going up together. Yeah, they're not diverging much. But that seems to look okay. We're gonna find out. I don't know. I'm pretty nervous, honestly. Those needles have to go up together. There's got to be even brake distribution between left and right brakes. They look pretty even, honestly. Huh. Oh, well that was the handbrake. I know. Yeah, but but if we did it right, it should pass. It doesn't matter who's testing it. Yeah. And it looks like they're really lined up perfectly. That's great. Now, is it enough brake torque? That's the question. I don't know. Oh, 
man. Find out. Okay, there's a happy face. Yes. What happened today? Third time's the charm. Just went to TIFF and because uh, the rear brakes failed the second time and it took the inspector quite a while to, to check it and he even went underneath and started poking around behind the brakes looking for something and then uh, he comes out and Jens asks, so the person filming here, Jens asks, uh, so is everything good? And he's like, it's not good. And so the Jens is like, but is it good enough? And this inspector, you should have seen the look on his face. He was like, ah, I guess. And so I passed, but like barely, like in, in, in the pretty much exactly how I sort of envisioned I would pass, just like by the skin of my teeth. So, but anyway, now I can get it registered and drive it legally on the road. Hell yeah. Here's the report card. You can see the front brakes are still strong and balanced at 400 left, 370 decanewtons right. You've got the park brake, 220 left, 150 right. That's within the 50% allowed. And then the rear brakes, which were giving me so much trouble. Not as strong on the right as before. It dropped down quite a bit. But by dropping down, it got closer to the left side. So the 110 decanewtons left, 140 decanewton right, that's within 25%. And that's a pass. If there's a single takeaway from this whole ordeal, it's that there's a reason why German TÜV is known as one of the toughest mandatory car inspections on earth. There's little tolerance for BS. Inspectors are going to check your car for rust holes, and if you have some, you fail. They're going to use a machine to check your headlight brightness and aim, and if it's off, you fail. They're going to put your car on a dyno and measure the brake force in decanewtons. And if your brakes don't make enough force or if they're imbalanced, you fail. Inspectors will put your car in a hoist that loads up your suspension and steering via sliding platforms. If there's too much play because your bushings or wheel bearings are bad, you fail. If you have cracks in your ball joints or tie rod ends or CV joints, you fail. There's also an emissions test in which inspectors will rev your engine to the sky. If you've got a loose hose clamp, you can expect that hose to blow off like mine did as you listen in horror as your engine screams and cries its coolant everywhere. TÜV is no joke, but then again, neither is a speed limitless Autobahn, and it's good to know that every car on it has been under the magnifying glass. Anyway, let's have a look at my TÜV sticker. Oh yes, it's glorious. With my $600 diesel manual Chrysler Voyager now legally on the road, I installed my Jalopnik sticker for the extra five horsepower. All right. <laughs> the J's a little bit off, but it's there. And now it's time to turn this interior into a living quarters so that I can sleep in this thing as I road trip around Europe. <laughs>